Welcome to the CDA Institute's Expert Series, the podcast that brings you critical discussions with thought leaders in defense, security, and global affairs, dedicated to fostering a rational and evidence-based approach to Canadian security and defense. The CDA Institute encourages rigorous debates on national security matters through our events, research, and publications. Last week, Defense Minister Bill Blair revealed a long-awaited update to Canada's defense policy titled Our North Strong and Free. The new policy outlines an additional $8.1 billion in defense spending and pledges a total of $73 billion in defense investment over the next two decades. In today's expert series, CDA Institute Executive Director Yuri Cormier discusses the implications of the update with former Ambassador to NATO, Kerry Buck, Vincent Rigby, former National Security and Intelligence Advisor to the Prime Minister, Gord Venner, former Senior Associate Deputy Minister of Defense, and Vice Admiral Darren Hocko, Canada's former military representative to NATO. I'd like to get your two positive highlights of the DPU, as well as maybe one negative, um, which you found in the document. So maybe I'll start off with uh, Gord on your end. Okay. Well, I guess reading through Strong, Secure, and Engaged, um, I was struck that most of the initiatives that are uh, described in Strong, Secure, and Engaged fall into um, uh, one of three categories. Um, and so two of those maybe fall into the positive side, and one of them is a little more on the, on the negative side. Um, the first category of initiatives that SSE deals with is items which were announced at the time of SSE and for which funding was committed or was included in the fiscal framework at the time that SSE was announced. And that included some initiatives, obviously, which predated uh, SSE, but were incorporated and rolled into the to the, to the project. Um, and I mean, just to, to provide an example, if you look at some of the naval projects, a lot of them fall into that, that range. The, the new surface combatants, which were replacing the frigates and the, the destroyers, which are now gone, the supply ships that are being built out west, uh, the a AOPS uh, vessels, all of that work was underway before SSE even began. Um, so the good news is that all of those things remain initiatives to which the government is committed. It's not trying to scale back anything. It's not reneging anywhere. Um, it's not saying, you know, maybe we can't afford quite this many uh, surface combatants, which is a criticism that, that some people have made. Um, so that, in a sense, is, is, is a good news story. It shows commitment to certain very major initiatives over a very long period of time. Um, and that's uh, that's that's good news story. The second category are the initiatives which were foreseen in Strong, Secure, and Engaged, but which were not funded, uh, pr principally because it was impossible to get the costing for those done at the time. And most of that had to do with the modernization of North American uh, defense. Um, but something else that characterizes those initiatives is that in a lot of cases, the government has taken action since the release of SSE to try and uh, address them and bring them forward. So uh, uh, recent budgets have provided money for the modernization of NORAD. Even the decision to buy F-35 uh, fighter jets was a decision that, that is part of, uh, of the, the initiative to, uh, to modernize NORAD, although obviously the jets have a, have a broader broader use. And once again, the government's not backing away from that. Those, those are, are some pretty big um, ticket items in there, and the government seems to be quite committed to, to doing that. So that's, that's good news. The third category, however, um, is where things get tricky. These are the initiatives which are genuinely new because they need to respond to changes in both the domestic and the international strategic security environment that have um, that have shifted since the, the study was since SSE was originally released, and it, with respect to those, um, we see a lot of cases of the government committing itself to study things and committing itself to analyze the situation and to trying to decide uh, how it wants to best go forward. And what's worrying about that is that an awful lot of the $73 billion, which is the headline number, which was attached to this, to this release, um, uh, is back-end loaded uh, into, uh, into a point in the future 
where those challenge kind of challenges would be would be met. Um, and if I had to give one example of that, I think it would have to be submarine. Uh, the, the SSE quite clearly did not anticipate purchasing new submarines that called for a, a midlife refit and an extension on the existing submarine. Uh, but the strategic environment's changed. Global warming is changing the Arctic. The ice caps are, are getting smaller. Shipping seasons get longer. The strategic rationale for submarines is, is increasing. So um, a lot of good news in terms of commitment to things that have been announced previously, but a lot less uh, confidence uh, is inspired by the studies and the, uh, the work that's uh, still left to do. All right, so I'm going to hand it over now to Ambassador Buck for uh, some commentary on the positives and the negatives to this. Well, my favorite thing and my least favorite thing is that we'll reach 1.76% of GDP uh, on defense spending uh, in 2029-30. It's my favorite thing. I mean, it's a serious, serious increase. And I said after a Strong, Secure, Engage that it was the biggest defense investment we've seen in decades. And, and this makes it much bigger if indeed they move to implementation, which is a different question. Um, so that's all good news. But if that were not in 2029-30, but it were today, that would still put us in the bottom third of the list of NATO allies. So it's really interesting. There was some good diplomacy done, I can, I can guess, when the American ambassador to Canada came out and said some pretty positive words about that increase in defense spending, as did um, uh, very senior staff uh, from NATO as well. Um, so the initial reactions, mine and from, from NATO and the U.S., were, were positive to the amount of money, but it still doesn't get us anywhere near where other allies are. Um, that 2% metric is problematic. Uh, it doesn't really measure military effectiveness, but it is the metric that is used politically at the alliance to measure how, uh, how serious uh, each ally takes their defense commitments. And for us, um, it's translated into a lack of readiness. We can't meet NATO um, standards. Uh, it was only, what was it, 58% of our committed uh, Canadian Armed Forces elements that were supposed to be ready to move. Only 58% are, are ready to meet our NATO commitments. Um, so we've got a lot of catching up to do. So that was my my favorite and my worst thing because it's going to, it won't fix it, but I honestly, good on the government if uh, that amount of money can end up um, being used for defense. Uh, there's also the absorption capacities that uh, Gord Venner just spoke about. You know, if you don't have the people in place to deliver um, and they don't have the plan for getting a full staff complement in the Canadian Armed Forces doesn't match up with the timeline for um, some of the other commitments. So um, that's going to be a really hard thing for D&D to deliver. My second favorite thing is on the Arctic. And it's not apparent um, up front, except for those of us who are deep NATO nerds and have been watching this for a long time. But that's actually a really significant policy shift, the way the Arctic is framed in the defense policy update. For years and years, Canada's position at NATO was that NATO should talk about the high north, um, that uh, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, his area of uh, concern, his area of operations, extends to the European Arctic. But the North American Arctic was for us in the U.S. to sort out. We wouldn't talk about it at NATO that much. Part of the reason for that was because we wanted to see the Arctic treated as a, you know, peaceable area. And at the that point, even post-2014, there was still some pretty useful and constructive cooperation with Russia that went on, but that's done now. So the way the DPU framed it, saying that our Arctic is um, the western and northern flank of NATO, and that's part of our commitment to the alliance, it's really important. It's really important because it signals that the collective defense guarantee is a two-way street that we worry about Europe and Europe has to worry about us too. And if we ever had a need for it, we should be able to call on them to uh, assist us uh, in our Arctic as they did post 9-11 with AWACS uh, aerial surveillance over North American skies. 
Um, so that's important, but I would say there's probably a bit more to be done on Arctic um, to make it actually work. Um, what I'd like to see is building on that inside NATO, more cooperation between Canada and the Arctic states, all of whom are in NATO now, except for Russia. Um, we should be the leader in Arctic warfare. I don't think we're seen as such with our NATO allies. We should be working on more interoperable, uh, interoperability um, with our Arctic allies in NATO, more intelligence sharing, more joint exercises. And outside of NATO, I think we should deepen our bilateral defense cooperation with those Arctic allies that sit inside NATO. In a way, I think that NATO plus NORAD should be seen as interoperable and also almost part of a contiguous Arctic space that we can manage together. Um, so that's where I'd like to see it go. The DPU doesn't go that far, but that policy shift for me was really interesting. Great. Thanks, Carrie. And we'll return to some of these issues with regard to spending and, uh, the allies in a second. Let's, uh, move over now to, uh, Mr. Rigby for your comments. So as usual, Carrie and Gordon have stolen all of my thunder. Nothing's changed since our days in the government. So I'm going to try and pick up the scraps that are left here, but, um, I would start off by saying that one of the best things that come out of the DPU is just the fact that it appeared. Um, we were hearing, I think, around town as recently as a month ago that this was never going to see the light of day, that it was dead in the water. It wasn't going to happen in this government. And I mean, don't forget, it was initially announced early in 2022 and it was supposed to be completed within six months. And two years later, I think we were all getting a little tired of waiting and had written it off. So I'm just really glad to see that it came out. And not only did it come out, but it's got some really good, strong language in there. It's very easy to be cynical about this document. There's been a lot of cynical press reporting and commentary, but I, I like the fact that you've got a document that's got a really, really strong section up front about the international security environment. So trying to explain to Canadians that it is a very dangerous and unpredictable world out there. There are a few cliches about the world being at an inflection point, which has been said a thousand times over by presidents and prime ministers, but that's okay. I think that's all right. But what I like is the fact that they're explaining to Canadians that the world is a dangerous place and it impacts Canada and it impacts Canadians. And so, you know, you read in poll after poll after poll that Canadians will acknowledge that the world is a dangerous place, but then when you ask them, how does it affect you? They say, well, not really much at all. I think this document makes a strong case that in fact does, does affect them. And I'm also really happy that it it's, it's a strong document with, with the funding that came out with it. So again, it's easy to be cynical. I agree with Gord 100%. Uh, a lot of it's back-end loaded. You know, the $73 billion is, is a, is a we'll, we'll see, right? I mean, it's going to be up to a new government, conservative or liberal, to actually implement this at the end of the day. But, but $8 billion over over five years um, and $73 billion over 20 years. That's a big commitment. And yeah, it's just words. It's just promises. But I didn't think we'd see those numbers. And to get up to 1.7% of GDP by 2029, 20, 2030 is, is pretty decent if we if we can do it. I'm with um, Kerry on the Arctic. Uh, I'd heard that the Arctic was going to be prominent. It's front and center. I mean, it's right there in the title. It's quite, quite something that jumps out at you. And to me, this was the one that we really need to step up on because it's the one place where Canada can make a difference in the Arctic, truly make make a make a difference. So um Kerry talked about the NATO perspective. I think that's really, really important. But we we take care of our Arctic because it's in our national interest and we need to do it. Um, but we also do it because it's in the interest of an alliance. But but let's not forget the United States. And I think the United States wants us to take care of our own backyard with them and move beyond just NORAD modernization, but to develop the, the capabilities up in the North to really to really help them out. So that's gonna really pay dividends, I think, in our US relationship. But I also agree with Kerry, there's a lot more that still needs to be done. And this is the military side, but don't forget that there's a huge civilian component to Arctic security and Arctic sovereignty. And so other government departments have to pick, pick up uh, the pace. Um, and I was very happy to see on the positive side that the government is now committed to a national security policy strategy every four years. We, of course, have only ever had one national security policy in our entire history. That was 20 years ago. And then a defense review as well. I'm, I'm still a little unclear how those fit together. The language is a little vague, whether it's one integrated study or it's a defense review separate from a national security review. 
They say at one point the defense review will be incorporated into the national security review. So I don't know what the mechanics are going to be, but hey, it's good news. And I think that's what we what we need. Um, the drawbacks, well, I've hinted at some of them all already, but uh, yeah, the spending obviously is is, is a concern in terms of the, the back end loading. Um, Kerry mentioned personnel. The one other piece I was a little disappointed on was procurement. I'd hope they come out with something a little bit more bold or a little bolder in terms of how they're gonna fix the procurement system. So, you know, there's an internal review going on within government on the procurement system. Well, I think there's been an internal review ongoing on procurement in government for as long as Kerry Gordon and I have been have been uh, working in this in this field going back many decades. I was hoping, and you can be cynical about this as well, that they might appoint a, some kind of a blue ribbon panel with some, some prominent Canadians um, with experience in procurement in the private sector, et cetera, to come in and try and fix this problem, give them six months and, and let them take a shot at it. But we didn't see anything of that nature. If you can't fix the procurement problem, it's this this policy isn't worth the paper that it's written on. And and, and much the same with the civilian, uh, sorry, with the um with the personnel issue as well. So um we'll see where we go with procurement, but that's got to be front and center. And then finally, um I'm totally with 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 Gord, I was really disappointed about the subs. I was hoping they'd come out and be bolder on on the subs. I think it's, I think it's downright pathetic, quite frankly, that that a country that prides itself on stating that it's got three oceans and it's a maritime nation, and is putting so much emphasis on the Arctic, and just came out with an Indo-Pacific strategy where they claim they're going to beef up security, their security presence. They don't have a plan to buy submarines. We effectively have no submarine fleet. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it's barely at sea anymore. And so to say that we're going to explore it is is kind of interesting. Um, and I'm also a little bit confused because the the document itself is very clear that it's going to be a conventionally powered submarine. Uh, but then the prime minister says that nuclear is not off the table. So that's great news. I'm very happy about that. Uh, but I'll believe that when I see it, because we all know the cost of nuclear nuclear powered subs these days. We've seen it through AUKUS. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of the AUKUS package for Australia is some of the neighborhood of $250 billion. I don't think we're ever going to get nuclear powered subs, but it was interesting the PM said it. But uh, but I would have loved a concrete commitment to, to go out and get subs and back up uh, what, we, what we're going to do in the Arctic and back up what we're going to do in the Indo-Pacific. Let's hear from Darren. I do think that uh, while there will be many people who will focus on specific issues, such as a specific investment or a way a certain thing is stated, if we step back and we look at the defense policy update in its broader frame, I would draw three real key outcomes to that. First, the government's intent to have a quadrennial defense policy and a national security policy cycle. Whether that is four years, five years, whatever, I think the actual statement and intent by the government to undertake such a, a regular cyclical review will ensure that we do not go protracted periods of time without an update to our defense policy, as well as our defense objectives in the context of policy and investment. So that's the first thing. Second is, is while there will be many who will talk through the uh, timing of investments, the staging and phasing of investments, the intent, the reality of an investment frame of 1.5 six, nine percent of GDP in the end of this decade, when considering where Canada was in 2014, at just under one percent, is a significant shift for Canada and is a reflection of Canada's intent to resource defense and security issues. I think it's important to see this in the context of where we are as a nation from election point of view. So, so first, I think, uh, I would want to see an outcome where there was a bipartisan recognition of the importance of that first point that I made, that we would want to have a cyclical review of our defense policy and our uh, approach to national security. I would look to see a bipartisan outcome where that level of investments is sustained. Um, so, so that would kind of be a first adjunct. In terms of things I think it got right, uh, in addition to those already mentioned, it would be a recognition that Canada has critical infrastructure that needs to be protected. It would be that we need to, in looking at our own Arctic, consider how we're going to properly resource the surveillance and monitoring of our own territorial integrity and operations in close proximity to Canada. 
that's uh, everything from over the horizon radars and the threat over the Arctic from from Russian Federation forces and weapon systems through to the ability to have cyber resilience and the ability to take action in the cyber domain to uh, the understanding that we need to have integrated air and defense for Canada's critical infrastructure in Canada, as opposed to always just preparing uh, deployable forces. The last thing on the pro side, Josh, that I would flag would be the idea of piloting a continuous capability sustainment, which will avoid boom and bust and midlife upgrades, which are challenging to keep right and really is is not effective in maintaining obsolescence or having a long-term engagement with industry. On the, on the other side of the ledger, there is a lot of ambiguity in a number of capability areas that are going to be explored, which I think is fair. If the government said it's going to do something, we would say, well, how much is it going to cost? What's it going to do? And they don't have all the answers because they're exploring it. But submarine capabilities, I would have looked for a more uh, unequivocal statement in that particular area. I would argue that the Canadian Army is perhaps less presently reinforced or the reserves less uh, clearly reinforced in government intent and what they're looking to do in those areas. I would have wanted to have seen a more clear reflection of the investment the government intends to make in defense infrastructure, which is in serious need of investment. And really, that's effort across all provinces, across, quote, all ridings, unquote. But it's it's effort and energy that the defense uh, Department of Defense and Canadian Armed Forces need to do because they fight from bases and wings. And, and it's just not seen in, a, in as clear and effective way as I think it ought to have been. I do find myself to be, um, if if I'm not underwhelmed, I was only whelmed, you know, by the relatively simple statement around the need to to reform or improve defense procurement, which has been so long con. But I mean, the CDAI just had a recent event, as you know, on defense procurement, and where we talked about in that session the strengths and weaknesses of the Canadian model and the strengths and weaknesses of the international model. And, and the piece that we're going to put out on that will will elaborate quite a bit. What I found interesting is the ADM responsible for this exercise within PSPC attended our conference, was an active discussant in the conference. And so I, I, I know that there is an effort underway within PSPC to consider just that question. Um, I would have liked to have seen a reflection in such a document on the types of objectives that the government has in this area, which were absent. However, in fairness, you know, this is a national security policy. It's not a transactional communications document. And so if they don't have something concrete to say they're going to put in action, it's hard to expect them to put in a transactional communication bulletin note on what they're doing to look at defense procurement, right? So so I think it's fair that it wasn't included because there wasn't anything to share. I know there's an activity underway. I would have liked to have seen what their objectives they will expect to be achieved through this exercise will be, an improvement of what type in defense procurement. That could have been a fair comment. Uh, if I added, if I started a new paragraph, my topic sentence would be, you know, if there was a defense industrial base policy or a defense industrial policy, I think that would go a long way to helping us understand the government's objectives and the nation's objectives in support of the defense industrial base. Yeah, so we're going to move now to our final question. It's just an opportunity to offer some final thoughts and maybe some messages for our audience, which is composed primarily of people who work in the defense and security space. Uh, what should they be taking out of uh, this document? And maybe um, as a Fun little addition, if you were asked by the minister to uh, provide a bit of advice on this file, what would you say? Well, I'm happy to start if you like, Yuri. Um, my final thought is just this. Uh, we, didn't, we didn't actually talk about the document so much because we, I think, quite usefully actually got into the, to the substance of, uh, of the commitments pretty quickly. But it was a really well-written document. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know I had a my first reaction when I looked at it was quite positive and I, I know others, I think Terry and, uh, and others had a, had a first reaction. They said, wow, there's a lot, there's you know, a lot here. And it is it's very well done, it's very well structured and it's, it's a great document. Unfortunately, it's so well done 
that uh, it might mean that if we don't read it really carefully, we come to the conclusion that it's going to deliver more than is really realistic. Um, and there are occasions where uh, they've chosen their words very carefully. Um, one that jumped out at me actually was in the, the letter from Minister Blair at the very front of the study. And he talks about all the great things the government's been doing. And then he refers to the fact that the government invested uh, $38.6 million in NORAD modernization in 2022. Well, in my book, when you invest money, it means you've spent it. Uh, and I don't think the government spent $38 billion on NORAD modernization in, in one year. I, if he said they announced it, that'd be great. If he had said they allocated it, even I could, I could understand that. But there's a tendency here to, to try and, you know, put the best possible face on, uh, on everything. Uh, and I guess my final thought is, you know, that this is very much going to be a case of sort of, uh, you know, you want to, Trust the government's good intentions, but verify uh, against every dollar spent. I would um, I concur with what with what Gord said, and I think it is a very well written document. I actually sent a little note to the policy group, uh, congratulating them on the document. I think uh, all three of us know what it's like to pull one of those documents together. Um, it's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. It's a really really tough process. So. Hats off to to the the departmental officials who pulled it together. It's a it's it's a, it's, a, it's a great it's a great piece of work. Um, I'm, I'm repeat a little bit of what I've already said um, in terms of top line messages for me. It's out. I think that's great. So we finally got it out, and it's got some money attached to it. Uh, whether it's back ended or not, it's got it's got some money. So I think that that is a, extremely good news as we as we move forward. Um, and let's, it's, it's so easy to be cynical about these things. I mean, these policy documents, they're, they're, they're often high level, right? It's, it's very rare that you get into the nuts and bolts and the, 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 the ironclad commitments to spend all the money and, and, and so on. This is a, a typical policy document in this, in this sense, it's, it's a, it's a strategy. It's quite high level. So the devil will be in the, in the details, but I, I back up or, or reiterate Gord's point, I think. The implementation is going to is going to be key, and I think the minister, the government's got to hold its own feet to the fire, but it's also got to hold the department and the CAF's feet to the fire as 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 well. So, you know, you see a lot of documents, strategy documents around the world now having implementation plans that come out a year or two later. I mean, we may have a defense policy review in four years, but wouldn't it be nice if they had an implementation uh, update every year? I mean, did you notice with the Indo-Pacific strategy that had an implementation document that came out after a year? Maybe they should do that with, with the defense policy. This is what we've done over the last year. And that, that'll that really hold them to account. And then on the implementation, I'll, I'll say it again, um, people on procurement, that's, what's, uh, that's what they're going to have to really, really focus on to make it work. So they did a really good job of uh, describing the international security environment right now and a really good job of drawing the links to international economic environment and international uh, stability and great power competition. The reason they had to do that is because we don't have a written foreign policy. I was thrilled that we had a national security strategy commitment to do one every four years and a parallel or integrated defense review, not clear how they're gonna manage that, but that's two legs of the three-legged stool. This whole thing has to be nested in what our international, integrated international policy is, what the Canadian interests are, and how we bring all of those elements, security, defense, but also our trade interests, our development interests, our diplomacy, our diplomatic tools together to deliver. International counts a lot for us. It always has because we're a trading nation, but it counts even more now with new threat vectors that cannot be responded to alone by countries alone. So yay, there was a forward by the Minister of Foreign Affairs in this defense policy update, unlike the previous one where there was a really last minute speech, excellent speech by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister Freeland, but still it wasn't integrated, but it's still not an integrated document. So I would love to see uh, the government um, understand that international, our presence, our investment in diplomacy, development, and defense, 
that they're actually not optional. They're not nice to have, but they walk right back to Canadians' interests, to our economic interests. Security, stability, supply chains, and the cost of food, they go, and pandemics, they all go hand in hand. So kind of time for us to take the international as a whole more seriously. And that would be my advice to the government. Although I've made that advice or request for an integrated policy review many, many times over the last few years when I was inside and out. And um, it's it's not happening yet, but one can hope. I, I heartily endorse what, what Carrie just said. I, I've been pitching for an integrated review for a while. I love the UK model. Yeah. Uh, they're tough to do, really tough to do. But as one of my counterparts told me when I questioned, how can you do such a complicated integrated review in the middle of a pandemic? And he said, well, you know, it's not that tough to walk and chew gum. It can be done. Um, and I'm totally with Kerry. I'm just, it, it boggles the mind that we have not had a foreign policy statement since 2005. Yes, we've had some speeches, some interesting speeches. But a comprehensive foreign policy, I mean, in a, in a perfect world, your defense policy is supposed to support your foreign policy. You set up the foreign policy interest and on the, on the security side, you, you actually have a defense policy that supports it. We still seem to be mismatched here. We're misaligned. And, and so if we, we keep up with that misalignment, we're not going to get any better. So national security policy, great. Defense policy, great. But where's the broader foreign policy scope and, and the development piece? Let's not forget development. Development's got a key role to play in security as well. So I think that's a really great point, Gary. And just because you both mentioned you know, defense policy review, and the next time we have one of these podcasts, uh, you know, might be after the next quadrennial uh, review comes out. Um, <laughs> I, I think that, it, that, it, that it's, it's, it's a great idea in principle to do this. I think the only country that I know of that has made it work uh, has been the United States, although even they had to, even they canceled one uh, at the beginning of the Trump administration. Um, but it seems to work for them partly because the defense policy review comes up immediately after every presidential election. Um, and I don't think we can do that. In fact, I just checked this morning to make sure I, my recollection was correct. And seven of the last federal elections, in, in the last seven, five returned minority governments and only two returned uh, majority governments. And uh, if you're, if the average life of parliament is, you know, between two and three years, or uh, it's very hard to see how you can, you can do quadrennial based planning. In fact, even if you go back further, which takes you back into the, to the Chrétien majority government, what you find is that they, they got majorities, but they didn't last four years. They, uh, you know, for their own reasons, they chose to, to seek mandates earlier than that. So I'm very skeptical about uh, this working in the in our parliamentary system. Uh, but uh, you know, God bless them. Uh, can't hurt to try. Yeah, it it will be, it will be a challenge. I, I agree to make this in reality. It sounds great, and I when I saw it, I was ecstatic. But but Gordon's 100 percent right. To, to, to make it actually happen is it's it's going to be interesting to see how it's pulled off and you, your point about minority governments and so on it, we don't have a u.s system right we don't we don't switch every four years and then we can we can structure our national security policies and 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 i mean i think usually they have, don't they have a defense a national defense document that comes out just before the national security strategy which informs it um they've got they've got a standard process um it's difficult for us to do that with our with our political system but but hope springs eternal if i was having a conversation with the minister of national defense what would i say i would say you know minister i think there are three areas where your personal energy could have a disproportionate impact because officials will get on with officials business those three areas would be uh seek bipartisan agreement for a quadrennial defense review and a national security review or cycle. Like create create the, the consensus that that is something that Canada, irrespective of the the uh, the make or color is 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 going to undertake that. Um, second would be engage with the ADM material group and the CAF on continuous capability sustainment, because that will realize uh, a change, a natural sea change in our relationship with industry. 
it will improve defense readiness. It will have a positive spreading impact on procurement and the ability to do procurement, and it will fuel re uh, normalized innovation because you will have the ability to see innovation introduced in a steady cyclical way and not in just these boom and bust moments of mid-life prefix. And the final thing I would advise the minister to, to be focused upon is the public facing communications and how that that kind of a construct enables Canada and also the defense industrial base to prepare and support national defense. A practical example of that would be the CAF blueprint, which is a published representation of defense investment plan. And that has been used and recognized by industry as an invaluable tool to understand what the procurement and acquisition and development intentions are of the government. Keeping that repository of information online available and current, which it is not today, would be the type of transparency that will allow all aspects of Canadian society, including the defense industrial base, to proactively prepare to support national defense. Because they'll know what's coming, they'll know what's required, they'll know when to be prepared, and they will make investments, and they will be there when we need them. All right, well, thank you very much. We're at time. Thank you, Ambassador Buck, Mr. Venner, Mr. Vigby, and Admiral Hocko for being here with us today. And uh, we'll see you soon, maybe in four years for the part two, I guess. That's all for this week's episode of the CDA Institute Expert Series. To learn more about the CDA Institute, you can visit our website at cdainstitute.ca or subscribe to our newsletter. Thanks, and we hope you'll be joining us next week.